You are listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Today, we are in our gate. Hello, I'm Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. Daniel Freed. Hi, both. And we're joined just at the start of this podcast by Tom Carey, the Telegraph Cycling Correspondent. Tom, this was your first ever day on the Tour de France. What were your impressions? Oh, it was pretty chaotic, I thought. It was great. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I've been in Formula One for the last five, six years, and uh, I was just blown away by that today. Quarter of a million people in Leeds at the start. Phenomenal, uh, you know, drama at the end with Cav. Yeah, a great day, yeah. How about that? Something that r- reporters who come into the sport um, struggle to or grapple with at the beginning is the access at the end. There's no organisation to... Uh, arranging interviews and so on how did you find that finish line experience today well I think that you know cycling compared with uh, compared with Formula 1 I think and that is one area that it definitely could could learn a bit from you know the, the structure of the, the sport in general and I found that to be the case you know when I've been out at Spring Classics earlier this year or, you know there isn't there isn't that much structure to it and I think that uh, you know they could they could do a lot better better it's on that a, score. It's a free for all. That that's the way we like it. Sorry, Tom, you're not going to change. You're not going to come in here and change the sport. Uh, I think before we get on with today's podcast, let's hear from uh, Christian Prudhomme, the director of the Tour de France, who we caught up with at the end of the stage just to get his initial verdict on how uh, the the first stage, the Grand Depart in Yorkshire, had gone. So, Christian, it looked like a huge success for everyone except Mark Cavendish. Fantastic atmosphere. Would you agree? Yes, it is beyond our dreams. It is beyond our expectations. Huge crowds, uh, beautiful landscapes, uh, passion for cycling, passion for a tour. Uh, French flags, British flags, yellow flags, uh, bunting, uh, bicycles painted yellow. Uh, but at times, it was l'Alpe d'Huez du Yorkshire. When uh, the arrival in Harrogate, in the, in the curve, 20 rows of people, it was unbelievable. They say 2 million people, perhaps more, but that was unbelievable. I got 25 text messages from friends, most of them are journalists, uh, from France, from uh, the Netherlands, from Belgium, even two friends from Qatar. And they were saying, uh, whoa, huge crowds. Tour de France is very, very popular, but it was really very special today. And the stop at Harrogate the podium as a royal family uh, it was unbelievable you said in, in 2007 that it was Im- unforgettable un- it was unforgettable <laughs> and impossible to imagine the tour would not return we're back seven years later can you see the tour returning to Great Britain even perhaps even sooner again I don't know but uh, it's, I don't know but it's such a success such a success maybe every year <laughs> Somebody already told me that. <laughs> but no, no, it, it was really impressive and very emotional, very, very, very emotional. Today, uh, the opening ceremony, for the first time, it was not team's presentation. It was really an opening ceremony. Everybody in the streets uh, saying merci, uh, saying thank you, saying vive le tour. Huge crowds, huge crowds, but many, many, many bikes on each side of the road. No, Magnifique. Just lastly, Christian, a lot of the riders said there was perhaps too much enthusiasm, the too many people. Um, no, no, you, 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 are, you are, as a journalist, very, very important. You have to say, you have to write, you have to repeat uh, all, all, all the, 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 what is necessary in terms of, of, of safety, security, safety. Hold the, 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 children's, the children by their hands, uh, stay on the same side of the road. Uh, do not cross, do not run. That's very, very, very important. But 99% of, of the public uh, was perfect. But you have to say for the other 1%, don't run, stay on the same side of the road. Yes, that's very important. And you are the messengers. The Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar, with Richard Moore, Lionel Burney and Daniel Freib. So we heard there from uh, Christian Prudhomme, the director of the Tour de France, the Grand Fromage, no less. Um, and earlier from Tom Carey, who is the Telegraph's cycling correspondent. You can read Tom's reports on the Tour de France every day in the Telegraph. But we should say a bit more about Christian Prudhomme, because what didn't come across in that interview, in the audio version of the interview, was the, the hand gestures, which added so much to his very a passionate dispatch on, on today's first stage of the tour here in Yorkshire. We should explain that Christian, as Prudy, as we call him, is a friend of the, the podcast and he was a special guest at this, the Cycling Writers of Great Britain 
Christmas dinner in London last year um, and, and he was a great sport he came along and agreed to uh, dress up as Santa Claus Father Christmas uh, and made a special entrance Santa Claus with sunglasses it was fantastic he's, he's a great character isn't he Daniel fantastic sport um, uh, a very charismatic man very good speaker as we heard there it's just always sort of inspiring to listen to someone who's so passionate about what they do and he certainly is very very passionate about the Tour de France um, and he's very very passionate about and the, the, the enthusiasm, the kind of explosion of interest there has been in the United Kingdom over the past 10 years and he's really kind of embraced that and the tour has embraced um, that as well. Yeah, I thought he was qu- actually quite emotional. I mean, he said it was an emotional, emotional day and you could see it in his eyes and, and I was trying to sort of imagine what it must be like to be the driving force behind creating all of this. Um, you know, it is down to him he had a personal hand in choosing Yorkshire I know there was a um, there was a kind of battle between Yorkshire and Edinburgh I know you were you were a bit upset that uh, Yorkshire got the nod initially Richard well, no. wouldn't you have wouldn't you have liked Edinburgh to have got it not with the bid that they put in in the end which was rolling out of Edinburgh and, and heading south I, I, did, I, I didn't I didn't fancy that so much as a prologue in Edinburgh I think would be spectacular but the Yorkshire Grand Depart I don't think anybody who, who supported the Scottish bid can have any complaints at all because we should get on to talking about today's first stage. Uh, we will get Christian Prudhomme back on the podcast, I'm sure. I know he's very keen to appear on it as, re- as regularly as possible. Uh, so daily, perhaps. Daily, perhaps. We'll be fighting him off. Uh, we should get on to talking about today's action because it was a, a tremendous occasion, huge, huge crowds, glorious sunshine. The, the, the clouds just kind of lifted. They dissolved just before the start of the stage, just minutes before the, the rollout from Leeds. And blue skies were revealed glorious sunshine that that was sort of bathed Yorkshire all day it was it was it was perfect um the forecast for Sunday isn't quite so so good but we've had a great day today huge crowds and fantastic racing as well um let's let's get on first of all to the sort of big talking point in terms of the the stage uh, it was won by Marcel Kittel second year in a row also the second year in a row there's been a crash in the finale that has taken out Mark Cavendish last year he was he was held up by it this year he was actually in it and arguably the cause of it um, he got tangled up with uh, Simon Gerrans who appeared alongside him and Daniel you've spoken before about Mark's very clear sense of the pecking order in terms of sprinters and how he sort of begrudges that that the, the non-pure sprinters the likes of Gerrans um, getting in their way in the finale was that something that crossed your mind as well as you watched the finish today? Um, no, I think the first thing to specify is that Mark has um, he's admitted that he made a mistake today. He went for a gap that wasn't there, and he's he's called or he's going to call Gerrans to apologise. Um, I think he's got his number off Mark Renshaw, um, but I don't really see it as um, as that being the problem tonight. I think. It has been a bit of a recurring theme in Mark's career that when he has been struggling, and by all accounts he's in very, very good form at the moment, but when I say struggling, I mean um, when he's under pressure, and he's certainly under pressure at the moment, he certainly has something to prove. The consensus seems to be that Kittel has the edge on him now. So when he's sort of straining, um, I've always felt that he's more liable to take risks, sometimes irresponsible risks. The example that always comes to mind is the the period in 2010 just before the Tour de France particularly the Tour of Switzerland where he um, was involved in, in um, a sort of infamous crash with Heinrich Hausler and, and that to me that year was um, symptomatic of Mark not being in particularly good form and really struggling to find his best form and you know I've always thought that the day then that Mark becomes a really a good loser is the day when he'll start um losing his edge and, and, and part of it is about refusing to lose and, and you know and sometimes he takes perhaps irresponsible risks in an effort to you, you said there that he uh, he said that he went for a gap that wasn't there he certainly did because he was completely boxed in and he, he moved across onto Gerrans um, with his head and shoulder um, pushing kind of Gerrans out into Brian Cockar of the uh, Europe, Europe car team and then uh, when, when Gerrans could go no further that's when the crash happened and you know he was completely boxed in um, coming up the sort of incline there at the, at the finish so um, 
you can see, you know, he desperately wanted to get out because if he if he had the legs to get round once he had clear road in front of him, um, he would have seen Kittle sort of getting away from him. And and the pressure was not necessarily that he wasn't good enough, perhaps, but that he was in a position that he didn't want to be in. You mentioned that he used his head and shoulder there, um, Lionel. He was actually briefly the face of head, head and shoulder. <laughs> he, head and shoulders. Slightly unhappy brand ambassador. Yeah, and unhappy. He was briefly the, the face of, or the head of, the hair of head and shoulders shampoo. But um, yeah, it was. Uh, he was, I think, at, at fault in the crash. And we should just pause here because a very special arrival has just sprinted across the road. Our first 2014 Telegraph cycling podcast supported by Jaguar appearance of Yes, it's our good friend Shiro Scognamilio from Gazeta della Sport How proud did that make you feel there hearing Lino Di Mamelli? Uh, I'm really proud but mainly because, in my opinion, without me, this podcast is too serious. I mean, I have this impression, so I have to take here something more funny for our listeners, in my opinion, according to me. This is my idea. You must be also very proud today, Chiro, uh, of the performance of... Um, I'm sorry, I'm just looking down the finish list to find the first Italian. While you do that, Rich, while you do that, I'd like to ask um, Chiro's Here opinion. Are, no, hang on. It was Vincenzo Nibali, no, 34. Hang on, on hang on, stage. hang on. Chiro, we've just heard the Italian national anthem there. We know that you've been following Nibali all year. What do you make of Nibali's Italian national champions jersey with a very discre- discreet tricolore in the middle of the jersey it's not the usual you know the classic jersey with the three um, uh, white um, green and and red bands well in my opinion it's not really a classical jersey I mean it's more an Italian flag put on the jersey of Vincenzo you know and certainly it's so different from the jersey for example of uh, uh, Arnaud Demar the French champions and so but in this case, I'm sure that Vincenzo would have preferred another kind of jersey. But you know that uh, teams in this case uh, can uh, decide, can decide because uh, it's the team that gives the salary to Nibali and not me and not uh, you and not our podcast. Maybe we are rich, but not so rich to pay the salary of Vincenzo Nibali. And so the team decides. I should just say there, we had uh, the Harley Harry Davidson, Harry <laughs> Harry Davidson. <laughs> the Harley Davidson Club go past there. And um, we're sitting outside an Italian restaurant, actually, Chiro, just for you. Uh, pizzeria, um, there's some ice cream over there. We, we were thinking of you. Yes, but I must confess, during my Tour de France, more or less one month, you know, I never eat pasta. I don't like, um, you know, pasta abroad. Uh, no. No, and not in Great Britain, I must confess. The, the, I apologize the, the, for our listeners, but it's like that for the, me. This is, the proper, this is run by Italian people, Chiro, this restaurant. Uh, uh, yes, but uh, I don't care. I mean, for me, pasta is something serious. More serious than the Tour de France. <laughs> for sure. Chiro, what happened to uh, Sasha Madolo today? He's had, a, he's had a very good season and he came in a long way down and looked very unhappy actually at the finish I was there when he when he appeared and it was what was wrong with him yeah uh, he was in a really bad mood at the finish line uh, normally in the first moment I thought that uh, he had some physical problems but as a matter of fact uh, he hasn't physical problems only a bad day well you know it was first day of his life in, his, in the Tour de France and he immediately understood what Tour de France means so maybe too much for him in a kind of stage as today maybe he could keep a revenge uh, on Monday in London but today awful day for him Talking of people who have had their very first day on the Tour de France, we've heard from Tom Carey of the Telegraph a little bit earlier. Today I spoke to Simon Yates of the Orica Green Edge team who got a very late call up um, for the Australian squad. Simon Yates is one of the Yates brothers um, from Berry and he's riding his first Tour de France and I spoke to him this morning and again at the finish line to find out how his day went. 
Someone said to me, somebody from the team said to me that perhaps your broken collarbone a little bit earlier in the season was a blessing in disguise because it gave you a kind of break from racing. It was a, it was quite a clean break, I gather, so the recovery wasn't complicated. Um, what sort of condition are you in going into the tour? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was a huge blessing in disguise, really well. I don't think I'd, I would be here if it wasn't for that. Yeah, I'm in some, some great form, I think. I've been training hard since the, since the break and been sort of preparing for the Tour of Poland which is another three weeks away whatever it is and uh, going back to the national championships last weekend or whenever it was uh, I was feeling good then you know and uh, I think it went going quite well and just sort of see how see how it goes How did you get the call and uh, what was your immediate reaction I, I, I'm assuming you jumped at it and said yes I'll do it Of course uh, so one, one's a last opportunity really how many times did it come back on your you know all the training roads and uh, still can't believe it really and uh, it started sinking in sort of yesterday the day before really with all the we're going back to all the media stuff and the team presentation it's just a huge opportunity that I, you know, hopefully I can take advantage of and what's your role particularly in the early days uh, well these first couple of days in, in the UK are, uh, they're all about Simon Cairns and uh, it's a bit of a shame with uh, Michael Matthews going home uh, through, through injury but uh yeah, with Sai, you know, he's one of the best riders in the peloton at the minute, and you know he's won the classics, he's won, he's won the yellow jerseys, you know he's won stages at all before, and uh, yeah, it's all about him for these for these first few days. Have you been able to give him any insight into tomorrow's stage in particular? Uh, yeah, well, we recon the courses, and uh, the only thing is, is that I know all the back roads to climb, so uh, you know I can tell him where the climbs and how how hard they are, but you know once you. The, the route so it was different so it's uh, yeah, it's a different ball game so you know the flat way around them <laughs> well yeah I just know all the back roads all the all the quiet roads not going down the biggest road in Britain and lastly uh, um, what's it like with uh, you being here and your brother Adam not being on the team this year obviously his chance will come but how's uh, how's the dynamic between you yeah yeah he's really pleased me he's, uh, I just speaking to him before uh, before we came here and uh, just saying good luck and all that that usual stuff he's on his way to a training camp actually in a minute so Simon, now it's all over. Can you sum up your first day on the tour? Stressful, very stressful. Um, yeah, just you know, having it's just the biggest race in the world, isn't it? So everyone wants to be at the front. Everyone wants to show what they can do, and yeah, it just creates for makes makes nervous racing. Yeah, pretty pretty uneventful really, except for a few climbs, a bit of crosswind, but yeah, yeah, it's all good really. People say that the riders ride so much closer together in the tour because the they want the gap between the front and the back of the bunch to be that little bit closer. Is that, did you experience that at all today? No, not really. As I say, it's just it's not really people fighting for to make the, the bunch small. It's everyone, everyone wants to be the front, you know. And uh, especially on these UK roads, you know, they're all they're pretty small compared to the mainland Europe. Nervous racing. Cy si Evans, he's he's come down. He's uh, he's he crash with crack cover from from what I know. I don't know how it's happened or, or anything like that, but. Yeah, he's come down pretty pretty heavily. I didn't have anything really to do with that. I was uh, I was looking after him sort of towards the middle of the on well up the climbs and around that sort of area. Are you just relieved to have got the first one out of the way and then uh, go again tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow's a bit more a bit more lumpy. So uh, hopefully I can do a bit more of a job there. You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. So Chiro has sadly uh, had to leave us, head back to tap away his uh, stories for Gazetta della Sport. We're outside Brio Restaurant, we've been told to mention it by the proprietor who, I'm sad to say, didn't sound very Italian actually. I think that maybe scared Chiro off a little bit. But he did say he's worked in Alpe d'Huez in the past and that he's uh, very fond of cycling. So Yeah, very familiar with cycling. Now we should ca- carry on talking about cycling because we haven't actually mentioned, I don't think, today's, <laughs> sta- today's <laughs> stage winner, uh, Marcel Kittel. Um, for I suppose the story that, that everybody thought we were going to have was Cavendish winning and being presented with a yellow jersey by uh, the Duchess of Cambridge on the podium that didn't happen but we shouldn't overlook the fact that Marcel Kittel won uh, I think his third opening stage of a Grand Tour in a row because he also won at the Giro in Belfast and I, I'm not sure Cavendish would have beaten him even if Gerrans hadn't appeared alongside him what do you think Daniel would, would, would Cavendish have got him? No, I mean, I think Kittel has got into this groove now of um, of great confidence, and when you have that confidence, you make very, very good decisions, and I think um, Kittel has immense speed now, and he's also making extremely good decisions. In addition to that, um, we saw again today, um, his his team tends to come very, very late. They they left it until about two, three kilometres from the end. Um, Cavendish's team, Omega Pharma Quickstep, worked a lot on this recently. They've kind of 
um, they have tweaked their approach to sort of the last five, ten kilometres. And today illustrated perfectly that you don't need, as a sprinter's team now, especially in a major tour, you don't need to be at the front with ten kilometres to go because the general classification riders will put their team at the front. Astana um, were there. I mean, Kofidis did an absolutely comedic turn at one point. I don't know what that was for. Um, they, they appeared with three riders at about 1.5 kilometres to go. But um, <laughs> and just faded, just dissolved like a rich tea biscuit. <laughs> come on, taking the Mickey out of Cofidis is too easy. It's too easy. Come on, come on. And um, <laughs> so Cavendish, you know, we we talked, I think, in a podcast last week about um, how at the Tour of Switzerland they were coming slightly later to the front, and. And um, what happened today was um, Lotto Bellisol were on the front, I think, with 4.3 kilometres to go. There was a right hand bend, and all of a sudden, Omega Pharma Quickstep had been kind of boxed in on the left hand side of the road. It opened up for them completely on the left hand side of the road, and they saw that as their opportunity. They came through with a lot of men at that point, maybe six or seven men, and it seemed as though they would have the horsepower to carry Cavendish through. Um, I mean, I felt that. It, I mean, it was a fantastic lead out that they did from 4.3 kilometres to go, but they were all on the rivet. I mean, it was such an intense finale. And, and you know, the, the kind of role of the lead out trains was almost minimised today by the fact that it was so difficult, and, you know, the strongest guy did end up winning. Quite a few times I've watched these sprints, I've watched Kittle win, I've watched his team just appear at the front in, in the final, even the final kilometre. And it and it's what's fascinating is. Uh, so often that's happened and I've thought oh, they've been lucky again and you start to realise it's not luck it's it's judgement and you think back to the days of HCC Columbia and they used to lead out sprints from about 20 kilometres and it's it, it seems almost um, like a different era you know at that time from between about 2008 and 2011 Camden had no competition at all. It was really on a plate for that team, and they were so in control that no, there were lots of sort of Kofidis uh, comedic um, efforts to to break up yeah, and to get in the way of that train. Milram and Mil- teams like that. Kofidis today were Milram esque. Milram, <laughs> yeah, Milram used to have a go, but um, you know, to think back to that just a few years ago when that was the pattern of all these stages every day, twenty twenty five kilometres to go, it'd be HCC Columbia at the front the whole way, just drilling it, and. I mean, Omega Pharma quick set sort of hit the front hard with about four k's to go, and they had a lot of firepower there. They had um, they had uh, Trenton, they had Tony Martin, and Nicky Terpstra. Uh, they were missing Alessandro Pataki, who was dropped uh, early and came in a long way down. I, I guess he was, uh, uh, you know, missed in the finale. But I still don't think that Cavendish would have would have got got Kittle. Do, what do you think, Lionel? Well, looking at the way that um, Kittle accelerated away, and he's just so strong and powerful. I mean, he is, he's like a, a, a racehorse that's kind of been let off the leash, isn't he, when he gets going. And, um, when are racehorses ever on leashes? Well, they have jockeys on them. Hang on a minute. Yeah, you're absolutely right. He's like a, he was like a, a racehorse. He's like a racehorse. Leashes. He's just like a racehorse. <laughs> Leashes superfluous there. You don't need that. Uh, have you not seen me walking my racehorse on the common? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. He's like a racehorse. And um, un- unlike Tom Boonen, who sprints like a sort of shire horse, um, Kittle is a racehorse. He really is. I mean, and, and he's so... He is so charismatic, and our photographer friend Simon Gill, who's been travelling with us for a few days, you know, he he just he took loads of pictures from the team presentation or opening ceremony, as as uh, Monsieur Prudhomme calls it. Um, he's taken pictures at the start, and and Kittle's just got star quality, hasn't he? I mean, the hair is extraordinary, and, and without sort of without making light of uh, his image, um, it is important. To, for cycling the, the, the winner and the yellow jersey he is a charismatic guy he comes in he joins in the jokes in the press conferences uh, you know he made a joke about the English weather and he was he, he dodged the, the iffy question about the Duchess of Cambridge uh, pretty well as well didn't he and he was asked what he, what, he, what he said or what they, what they spoke about he said that must remain confidential which was good I mean, well, he, um, what, yeah exactly so he, did he ask her out or no, well, at least she's married Lionel I don't know if you realise um, but she's and, and the mother to the, the, <laughs> the, the heir to the, the we're going to end up in the tower if we're not careful I, um, I think you know there is uh, supposedly news coming of a, a new German, big German sponsor um, taking over NetApp and Jura. Also news today that uh, German television are going to start broadcasting the tour again. And Kittel could be just the sort of figurehead for that. He is 
a, a really refreshing uh, character obviously a, a supreme athlete very successful now doesn't seem to be changing with that he's still the very approachable um, sort of down to earth guy who like Cavendish always does pays great tribute to his team um, and, and there have been times like I said earlier where I've wondered what did the team actually do which is uh, silly because you can see that they're following a plan it's just a different plan to other teams and, and the work they do is not so obvious at all but it's it's very very effective you're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast supported by Jaguar tweet us at cycling underscore podcast the negative point is just it's too crazy it's too much people it's on the climbs I mean you go single file up you have to break there's people they had to walk I think some security is just missing somehow also on the road. I mean, all good and nice when you see all these people, but for us riders, when kids are standing on the road and people with the wheelchair or kids chair or all kind of people get so enthusiastic, I think they have no limits. And we know our limits, and our limits is actually the road. But, I mean, we come with 50 or 60k an hour. I think lucky that so far what I saw, nothing really happened big, but... I hope uh, tomorrow, the next days, we're going to see still so many people on the road. That's one side, like I said, it's nice, but also it's dangerous. And this dangerous is not something fun. I mean, uh, it's our health that is also on the on the cart. And I think um, I hope they will find a little solution that at least some house on the climbs, they can, uh, yeah, can put the people a bit more to the side. Otherwise, it's also have influence of the race. So that was Fabian Cancellara there, the Swiss rider from Trek Factory Racing, also known as Chief Commissar, who uh, who, uh, who really um, put the cat among the pigeons in the final kilometre, attacking on this steep ramp that we'd all heard about, um, which I think probably didn't look as uh, devastatingly steep on TV as, as people who'd ridden the course said it was going to be. But nevertheless, it was a launch pad for Cancellara to launch a, a really pretty good attack. Um, and at one point, it looked as though he might just pull it off. He's done it so many times before. We've seen him escape like that before. Um, I remember in 2007, when he'd won the prologue in, in London, uh, a few days later when the race was back in France. It, when he, when he, was in, he was in Compiègne, it was in the yellow jersey, and he took off like that in the, in, right to, close to the finish. And over, a, over those little cobbles in Compiègne yeah, as well, just, wasn't it? Yeah, just, he just needed a, a tiny launch pad, and he took off... And that was a really fantastic victory, and almost did it again today. Uh, didn't quite do it, but Daniel, you were—I think you spoke to him at, at the finish, didn't you? Yeah, I mean that was the chief commissaire Cancellara talking about the the danger on the course today, and you know, this is something a lot of the riders talked about. Um, uh, Thibaut Pino said it was just crazy. He said it was like 200 kilometres of Alpe d'Huez. Um, the fans all over the road, fantastic, but also. Um, quite sort of hairy from the riders' point of view, and you know we heard Christian Prudhomme earlier, um, sort of appealing to the fans tomorrow to keep their distance, to um, not run out into the road. Um, and this is something that on, watching on TV, I don't think we can really appreciate. Um, you know, we knew the roads were going to be narrow today. It was something that anyone who had recorded the course had emphasised. But you know, we don't really get the, the sense of danger that I think the, the riders are, are experiencing out there on the roads. We also saw that, I mean, there were a lot, there were splits in the group because the riders couldn't physically get through the, the gap that was left by the crowd. You don't often see riders stop having to stop to file through a, a very narrow gap, and that happened a lot today. And it could have been, it could have had devastating effects. I mean, Thibaut Pino was one of the riders who was off the back for a while. Joaquin Rodriguez was off the back. Chris Horner was off the back as well in a little group it all came back together but you know that could have an impact on on the racing on the on the actual classification well yeah i mean i spoke to jonathan vorters who is one of the kind of movers and shakers in the uh, the work to kind of modernize and market cycling more broadly and mimic some some of the other sports in making it more televisual and he agreed that the spectacle was absolutely fantastic but as a race itself um, there were some hairy moments and he said pretty much nothing you know it didn't didn't go wrong but um there were some yeah it was it was it was I think he said uh, there was there was some tense, very tense moments in in the race, and I think that's borne out by the fact that the 
time for the stage was four hours 45 minutes which was on the slowest schedule that ASO set in the road book so perfect conditions for racing I mean there was a bit of wind about but it was a circular route so you know you what they would have lost in some places they would have gained elsewhere so the question of Richard you said at the start great racing I'm not necessarily sure it was a great race it was a fantastic spectacle but the in finale is what I really meant. Yeah. Fantastic yeah. finish. And I, think, yeah. and I think, Lionel, we saw there was a, a kind of odd phase in the race with um, <coughs> when the the last remnant of remnants of the breakaway were caught. Um, I think 30, 40 kilometres to go, and it, it's very rare to see the group together and to see no one attack. And they were pretty much riding tempo for 20, 30 kilometres. And I think that was just because they'd expended so much nervous energy um, in in the previous 130 kilometres. Yeah, there's a few people in the press room suggesting that perhaps there was some kind of unofficial go slow. And you mentioned the chief commissaire, um, uh, Fabian Cancellara. We remember 2010. <laughs> He's now basically officially chief commissaire. Isn't he? he is. We're going to give him some kind of tabard, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, 2010. Remember when it rained in the Ardennes and there was the very iffy de- descent where um, one of the Schlecks fell and Spa into Spa into Spa in the Ardennes in Belgium. Yeah, and uh, it rained. One of the Schlecks fell and Cancellara kind of kept it all together and um, I think Sylvain Chavanel was already out in front, won the stage but the ra- race behind was neutralised it certainly wasn't like that at all today but using all of the evidence out there the race time, the way the race kind of evolved and then as you say Daniel that kind of lull in the, what you would expect to be the most aggressive phase of the race with people taking a real chance I'm sure it didn't go round like a memo but self-preservation comes into it at times as Chris Froome said you know there's a metre and a half of road for them to get through and it was single file all the way and so um, it's the first day of the Tour de France at the end of the day yes the stage wins up for grabs but nobody wants to be ruled out because they've they've crashed into the crowd or they've been uh, you know they've overshot a corner Chris Froome sixth on the stage which was quite a quite an amazing uh, and unexpected result And, and I spoke to him briefly at the finish and asked whether that was an indication that he was actually very good for him because it's it's hard to be up at the at the the sharp end of the race and you know it was hard in that in those closing kilometers to be there just to be there can often be indicative of good form he he wasn't reading anything into it at all he said he was keeping out of trouble the irony being that the crash with Cavendish happened right alongside him and you know a few a meter or so to the right and and it could have been Chris Froome taken down as well we should probably wind this up a bit have you got something else to say Daniel Just the thing. Bit, right? I mean I think um, that it, it sort of pays tribute to how good a, a victory it was by Kittle that riders like Froome were up there Navardowskas mm. was up there who you know he's a very strong rider but not renowned <laughs> for his sprinting ability and um, yeah just in terms of again going back to the finale and all the teams we saw up there you know we were lucky today I think that we only really saw one major crash which was Cavendish's um, you know you could see the, the sort of ingredients for a disaster brewing today with 10 kilometres to go teams who you, you know, completely unfathomable reasons to be up the front. AG2R were up there at one point. You look down their roster, they've got Roman Bardet, who at best can finish in the top 10. Um, so, I mean, it's just a huge, huge battle. Great for us spectators, but for the riders, I think um, it's going to be a hairy few days. Do you have some news today, Daniel? Some oh, transfer yes. speculation? Yes, I did. Yeah. Um, very briefly, so, um, and I, I have to stress that my sources are not the same as. Richard sources Baskin Robbins the king of the scoop Um, so I'm led to believe that Lars Boom is in very advanced negotiations with Team Sky and um, would very much like to join them next year and another friend of the podcast we mentioned Prudy earlier Christian Prudom um, another friend of the podcast Pippo Pozzato um, spoke to his um, no spoke to the Trek team manager Luca Guercelena a couple of days ago with Chiro I should I should add, and Luca worked with Pippo at um, Mape, the under-23 team, um, about 10 or 12 years ago, and he said he'd love to have Pozzato, but at the moment his asking price is just a little bit too high, but um, it gave me the impression that there might be some wriggle room there and, and, and there might be an opening for Pippo. Maybe we can chip in. I think we should start. A, <laughs> let's start a fund, Pippo to Trek fund. Let's, let, we, can, we could get a name on, on his jersey. Perhaps. Uh, chipping funds and cycling haven't gone well in the past, though, have they? Telegraph cycling podcast supported by Jaguar. There's, there's surely room for that. Or a tattoo. 
<laughs> you, get a you get a tattoo on people's trunk. How about that? Anyway, let's wrap up. We don't want to give people too much to listen to. We're trying to keep these podcasts yeah. a little bit briefer. Can I just say, we got photobombed a bit earlier while you were talking, Richard, and I, I was worried that that's you were going to get, like, pickled why, or something. That's why I lost my train of thought <laughs> all those times. So we, we've not mentioned David Cameron. I saw him taking selfies at the finish line. Uh, we've not mentioned Kate Middleton. No, we did mention Kate Middleton, didn't we? Go to the Duchess of Cambridge. Daniel, I was following protocol. <laughs> you just break it. Uh, well, thank you very much, Lionel. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. It's been brilliant. <laughs> It's not over yet, Lionel. It's only just start. I'm tour, going. I'm going home tomorrow. I don't, I don't know if anyone realizes that the tour continues beyond Yorkshire. Oh, right. it, it actually carries on to France. Nobody here realizes that. But we are going home tomorrow, aren't we? We are going home tomorrow. But we are going to be podcasting every day, as we've said. Yeah. And uh, Daniel, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. We'll speak to you again tomorrow. Podcast daily during the Tour de France. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar.